transactional situation is a, a situation where um, a set of conditions prevail at a given moment. And based on that set of conditions, the system can decide what action or actions to take and what action or actions not to take. And that the, the conditions are influenced very little, if at all, by things, events, which have happened in the past and conditions that have prevailed in the past. In other words, each transaction is independent of previous transactions. So an example of this would be a ATM or automated teller machine. Each customer's interaction with the ATM is um, insulated from the next customer's. Similarly, printing monthly checking account and savings account statements for bank customers is another transactional situation. The um, particular conditions that apply to a particular customer and their accounts determine how their statement will be printed and delivered to them, but that will not influence the subsequently uh, printed and delivered statements for other customers or transactional, they're, uh, they're insulated one from the other. Now that is in contrast to situations like what we're going to look at with state-based testing, for example, where the sequence of events and conditions that have occurred in the past are very strong influencers of the way the system is supposed to respond. And in fact, that's, uh, that, that uh, influence is, is captured in the concept of a state, which um, determines uh, how those previous events and conditions affect the subsequent or the current events and conditions that prevail and occur. So once we're going to separate those things, we're going to deal with state-based testing later, subsequent webinar. Uh, we're going to deal with transactional type of situations here, and the use of a decision table to test those transactional situations. Now. Underneath this uh, concept, this test design technique, is, is a, a model. Um, it's uh, either a table or a uh, logical or Boolean graph that connects the conditions that exist with the actions to be taken and the actions not to be taken. Um, now, the thing with the model, the thing to remember about these models is, yes, there is some intellectual overhead associated with understanding the model. However, the thing about the model, what it gives you once you understand it, is, it is that with these techniques, many of these techniques, there is a systematic process for deriving tests from the model. And what that means for decision tables and some of the other advanced techniques that we're going to look at is that it is possible to explain to someone how to use the model to derive the tests, and they will derive the same set of tests, for the most part, with some variation, as anybody else would. Now, I say with some variation because um, there's always the possibility that someone might apply uh, techniques uh, in a compound kind of way and generate additional tests, and we'll look at an example of that later. But this, this creates a degree of certainty about um, what, what is to be tested. And it also means that this is a concept that can be explained and, and mastered. Some of the more uh, reactive test techniques, such as the uh, use of exploratory testing, for example, is very difficult to explain to somebody what, what you tested and why, especially the why part. Uh, here, with decision tables and other kinds of formal techniques, you can certainly say, you know, these are the things that I tested, and this is why I tested them. And if you choose to transcend the technique to add additional things to it via, say, exploratory testing or the uh, addition of multiple techniques, that's fine. You can explain that as well. In other words, it makes the testing a more deterministic type of event um, and something that we can have confidence in that, that uh, we, we know that certain things have been achieved. So back to the decision table proper. So the decision table or a cause-effect graph connects conditions with actions to be taken. 
And then there exists a process, which I'll explain to you, by which you would derive test cases from the um, decision table. And basically, that, that process is going to involve making sure that you fulfill the different combinations of conditions that are shown in the table or the graph, and you check that the appropriate actions, and only the appropriate actions, were taken for any given combination of conditions. Now, <clears throat> along with a systematic process for the derivation of tests, there is, for many of these techniques, a rule for when the technique the model is done suggesting new tests to you. And these are referred to as the coverage criteria. So in decision tables, the, the, the coverage criterion is that there has to be at least one test per combination of conditions. And in the decision table, each column in the table represents a, a unique combination of conditions. Now, a couple of things to mention about that coverage criteria. Uh, coverage criteria in general is a concept, and also this coverage criterion listed here in particular. Now, the word coverage is one of the most uh, overloaded terms in software testing because it means a lot of different things. Legitimately, when I say overloaded, I'm, I'm talking about in, in the sense that we would use that phrase in object-oriented uh, programming. It depends, the context determines what we're talking about. So in a recent webinar, I talked about code coverage. And there I was talking about the structural coverage of the system, how many of the statements, what percentage of the statements have been executed, what percentage of the branches have been taken, and so forth. And um, so code coverage is one kind of uh, coverage. Um, talk about requirements coverage. Is there at least one test for every requirement specification element? Uh, risk coverage. Is there at least one test for every risk item that has been identified? Uh, design coverage, looking at design element coverage, uh, supported configuration coverage, uh, workflow coverage, use case coverage. There are many different ways of looking at coverage. But we don't mean those ways that I just mentioned here with these techniques. Coverage here refers to coverage of the model. In other words, every element of the model that suggests a test has been addressed. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't any more interesting tests to create. Of course, there, there are. And of course, with most real-world systems, there are an infinite number of tests we could create. Co achieving the coverage criteria um, here means is the particular technique, and in this case, we're talking about decision tables, done suggesting new tests to us. Now, to this coverage criterion in particular, I notice it says at least one test per combination of conditions. So that suggests a certain flexibility in that there might be more than one test. And of course, there could be, because there could be multiple interesting ways in which a condition could be satisfied or not satisfied. And conditions might be defined on ranges of values that have minimum and maximum values as well. So this opens up the possibility of applying equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis to those um, conditions, which I will demonstrate a little later in this presentation. Now, with all of these techniques, all the advanced software testing techniques that we're going to talk about in this series, which, as I said, will go on for as long as we all find it interesting and useful, <clears throat> 